understanding, which many have discussed throughout the course. This means creating a first unit that teaches the terminology, during understanding, and allows students to make objections in their own minds. The traditional practice of handing out vocabulary books and reading the first chapter on day one needs to be reconsidered. Instead, engage in a dialogue with the students and do some activities where students have the opportunity to demonstrate what they already understand about the community theme. When Unit 1 is complete, students should understand all components of the enduring understanding, give personal examples of each of the ones you intend to use, and connect a piece of content to one or more of the enduring understanding. So right off the bat, the introduction um, of this woman, she is talking about um, how to approach the first day of school. And as she's going along, um, she's doing a lot of head movements, mostly when she's making comparisons. You know, she'll move one side to the other. Right there, she just listed off um, the three things that teachers should touch on on the first day of school. And, um, and she paused after each one. So, um, for emphasis. Let's see what this looks like in practice. Who plans on going to college? Miss Beth? Why? Because I think I'll be more successful if I have a college education. Okay. You think you make more money? Yes. Maybe get a better job? Yes. So it'd be good for you long term? Yes. Okay. Now, what has the government of the state of Georgia done to help students get to college? Import grants and options. By name, by name. Hope College. Hope College. And what is the Hope College? Scholarship to students who are making students. Georgia is maintained with that great one after the first year. They pay for you to college, right? Right there, the teacher did some back channeling, nodding his head, showing that he understood what the student was saying. Um, in this incident, he's asking lots of questions, asking the students to, you know, kind of pull in from the students what they know, what their personal experiences are, that kind of thing. So he's kind of like testing the waters um, by that way, and um, he's using that to engage in the audience as well. Right there, he nodded his head. Okay, right now the teacher is using the word belief over and over and over again. Every time he refers to something that the student is saying, he says the word belief. Every, you know, the government, what the government, um, what their beliefs are, he uses the word belief. So he is using this word over and over and over again to emphasize a point. And that's something in my interpretation that I need to make sure that I believe, 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 the government believe. The student belief, teacher belief, and making sure that, you know, I, this sign is over and over and over again for that same emphasis. And you think that could actually lead to other students wanting the same thing, right? So here we have the government making a decision. 
they give away a lot of money, right? College is expensive. So the government's going to give away a lot of money based on a belief. Right? So it's an economic decision based on a belief. Better people who want to go to college should be there. Therefore, we are consistent with it. Right there, the professor, um, he was he was saying that the the more money that the government spends on college, the more likely the students are going to want to go to college. So he roll shifts from right to left to kind of show if this happened, then this happened. The 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 cause and effect. As well as the belief point of view, believe in ideal. And I'm going to use the term belief in ideal. Who in here has ever done some kind of volunteer? Again, in this professor, he uses um, a question to transition from he was talking about beliefs and now he's asking about volunteer work. So the question is used a lot in educational practices because it gets the students thinking about what's coming up next, what kind of questions are coming up next, um, what topics are going to be discussed. So it's kind of like a a prediction method for the students to start thinking about what's going to be talked about next. Again, he um, he asks, you know, does anybody else have any comments, any questions? To kind of, you know, we're starting to close this up, and I'm getting ready to open up a new topic. So, um, again, this whole video is surrounded by the teacher making a connection with the students, and the students making a connection to what he's teaching. So, the teacher, the register that he's using when just talking with the students about their personal experiences is more of a lower register like he kind of puts himself down with the students and then when he brings it back when he relates it back to government he kind of hires or heightens his register um, to talk about the subject so um, he's using these techniques to kind of help the students understand somebody with more experience shopping right? say mom has more experience shopping than you do giving you advice on the shopping and it turned out to be the correct thing. What you're going to see in government is that that happens a lot. We have government decisions that are made based on previous government decisions, prior documents that were written long before our government was around, that actually have turned out to be correct. And sometimes we try.
try to do things in government that don't work out so well. And then we're going to talk about something that later on in the first public article of the Confederation and how we tried to do it on our own. We tried to go out and buy that shirt. We thought we could do it. We thought we were really smart. But uh, in the end, it turned out it wasn't really the best way to do it. We had to do it so I could get advice from people who were structuring government in Washington. Yeah. Has anybody ever tried to change something in school? Like a pep rally or a location to write the wrong thing? So whenever, again, he uses another question to transition, um, another thing that we haven't really talked about in class, but I just noticed, is back channeling can either be like a head nod, facial expressions, but also hand raising is another form of back channeling. Um, you know, when, when the teacher's like, how many of you had breakfast this morning? And the teacher and the students raised their hands. How many, you know, that's, he's not asking for people to say, like, raise their hand and he calls on them and they say, oh, yes, I had breakfast this morning. It's implied that if you raised your hand, you had breakfast this morning. So that's another form of back channeling to let the teacher know how many students are participating in something or have experienced something. So that's another form of back channeling um, and just another way of participating in the lecture. Now, how did you go about doing that? Well, at first, I, I went down to the council's office myself to try and see if I could get a change in the thing that the sign of just one of the exact form of the log issue and then pipe down individually because they were taking this long and by that time the school was already progressing. So, therefore, I ended up telling my mother about it and she actually had to get it to help me get a change. Now, why did you feel like your schedule needed to be changed? Well, because I wasn't satisfied with the class or the teacher that you know, that was teaching and I didn't feel that I had to find the material that I needed to talk to the teacher and the other thing was respected. In the background, you can see the student to, uh, that's directly behind the student that's speaking. He kind of nods his head as well. So there's even back channeling going on within the audience, within like the student body. So when one student is talking, all the other students are also kind of nodding their head as well to back channel to that student. So it's not just student teacher in this environment, it's also student to student, peer to peer, and also teacher to student. Like you said, your, your mom makes it essentially to your home, right? Why did you feel that was a necessary step to take? Well, because uh, I felt that the council was going to listen to my voice so that I felt, I felt that they were going to put this into my parents. Why would they give your mother more weight or more credit than they would give you? Well, because she's actually an adult too. And, and uh, by adults, she doesn't listen to adults who want to give you things. She's young. So let's, so let's look at this. In this case, the decision was what? What was your decision? To change my schedule. Change your schedule. And it actually was kind of decision. And they decided to get the mom. Now, what was the belief that you thought that was going to be that I would that I would find the material that was being taught in the class? What were you thinking? And what was your belief? What was your idea? What were you thinking? You said to get taught that they would actually listen to what she had to say instead of just how they were thinking. Anybody else have a comment on this? All right, now this is okay, again, the teacher asks, does anybody else have a comment on this one? Pauses for about five seconds, and then he says, okay, and moves on to the next thing. So the opening, or the closing is, does anybody have a comment? And then the opening is, okay, and then he moves on to the next thing. Absolutely perfect. Because when we talk about government, especially when we talk about interest, Talk about interest groups later on this year. He just asked a rhetorical question and uh, then moved on to his topic. He, he asked about the interest group. Has anybody heard about an interest group? And then he moves on to what he was saying. Um, including those rhetorical questions appropriately is important for sign language and for the deaf student because um, 
you know, when he asked that rhetorical question, it's supposed to get people thinking, like, oh, have I heard about that term before? Have I not? Like, maybe I have just in a different class or out in the, you know, my, my parents have used it. So, um, you know, those rhetorical questions, even though he was not wanting an answer and it was just kind of slipped in there for his lecture, it's something that the interpreter should include because, um, that's a learning moment, that's a thinking moment, and that's a moment that needs to get the deaf student to really start thinking about what the teacher is going to be talking about. This is one interesting thing for all of that. It's hard sometimes for a legislator or a senator or a representative to listen to just me or just you. And they have a lot of people they represent. But if we can get an interest group involved, in this case your mom, they will listen to that kid because it's a louder voice, right? It's more legitimate for time and money they can research. They know the issue. So when an interest group goes to the legislature and they say we want this particular bill passed, they're much more likely to do it. Did your schedule change after your mom got involved? But not before then, right? Same thing. We have this belief, in this case your belief was that well the administrator, the council listen more to the government. We can change that around a little bit. There's a belief in government that legislators listen more to a large group of people. Same thing with the scheduling change. I had this belief that I wouldn't learn as much. I'm not going to learn as much. Uh, if it's not going to be beneficial for me. The policy needs to be changed. So we need to make some changes. Our beliefs affect our decisions. So right now he's doing a lot of comparison or cause and effects. Your belief affect your decisions. Um, great time to utilize role shift shifting, set up where the beliefs are and the decisions and compare the two because he's comparing government or government and the students experiences um, so maybe setting up the role shifting from side to side because even on the board he's he's leaning to one side when he says beliefs and he's leaning towards the other side when he says decision and he has it in two separate columns to show that comparison so Utilizing what's visually accurate, what's visually on the board um, within the space for the interpreter is actually a really um, strong method to use, um, and it also will match what the speaker is saying too, because this intonation of the belief, blah blah blah, affects your decision, blah blah blah. So, you know, showing that comparison. Uh, making it visually, you know, the same as what's on the board can really just help the student understand better. Okay, again, he said, is this starting to click for you? Good. Okay, now, so in teacher, um, the teacher environment, or when a teacher is lecturing, they use, for closing, I've noticed a very significant pattern that they ask a rhetorical question, everybody understand, everybody got it, everybody on the same page. Good. Now, so he kind of like brushes it aside and now he's bringing up a new topic. Beliefs and ideals on a personal level. We talked about some of the decisions that you guys have made. What I want to do now is take that and make it a little bit bigger, make it broader, so that we can use the government as a whole course. So if you want to open up your notebooks and on that first page, you see a chart that's very similar to this one. It's got our five themes. Five connected themes that I talked about earlier. Only five things that you really have to focus on in the course. There's everything that needs to be part of it. But it's not enough just to say beliefs and ideals. There's obviously something I want you to understand about beliefs and ideals. Right? What that's going to be called is an enduring understanding. Enduring means long term, and that's a long time understanding of what I want you to understand. So that's what we're going to write here. What is it about beliefs and ideals? What I want you to put in the first box. Beliefs and ideals of a society influence social, economic, and political decisions of that society. Beliefs and ideals of society they think to be true, which we talked about earlier, they think to be true, affect
Okay, here the teacher is even, every time he refers back to beliefs or ideals, he points to the board. When he is talking about something that the students have said, he points to the student and then leads back to the board. Points to the student, back to the board. Government, back to the board. So he's using this like forward and back movement to show, to kind of like visually connect, you know, what was set out here connects to what's on the board here. So maybe showing that as well with shoulder shifting again or, you know, just trying to relate those, you know, that same movement in motion that the teacher is using and in his voice to use that with my body. Right. When we decide not to buy a shirt or to change something we've already worked on, it's based on the beliefs we have that somebody has better advice. So as you can see, he said beliefs and ideals probably about 50 times during this lecture because that was what he was trying to get at. Um, that's a use of repetition. Uh, that's the use of, you know, really emphasizing these are the terms that we're going to be using this semester. This is what we're going to be talking about and making sure that um, either if the first time the interpreter signs it, the student gets it to continue to use that, or, you know, if the interpreter signs it in a way and the student just has a quizzled look on her face or doesn't look like they understand, making sure you sign it in a way that they understand it and repeat that same way that they understand it over and over again. Because this is a point that he's trying to stress, and it's important to, to stress that point the same way that he's doing it with the hearing kids and the same way that the interpreter is doing it for the deaf student. So yeah, the um, the main the main takeaways of this is that um, you know when the teacher is using you know higher intonation or is a little bit louder talking about the beliefs, you know making sure that that sign matches his voice intonation that when he's referring to the board or when he's making comparisons that those connections are also made visually um, with shoulder shifting, eye gaze, body movements um, to really match what the speaker is saying.